All right, up with us we have Razvan Kurnia. He is a core developer at OpenSIP Solutions. They are a 32-bit sponsor. Give him a round of applause for making the conference possible. <laughs> Razvan is part of the OpenSIP's core team. He designs and builds complex VoIP platforms with OpenSIPs as the core. He's going to be telling us how to use OpenSIPs 3.0 in front of your free switch servers and behind private networks. The title of this talk is OpenSIPs 3.0 as an entry point to private networks. Give a round of applause to Razvan. Thank you very much, guys. Um, hi. Uh, uh, it's nice to be uh, to attend another ClueCon uh, this year, uh, and hopefully uh, I met a lot of new guys here. My presentation is not going to be so uh, long, so it's going to be a quick one because I just I'm so hungry and I want to have lunch as fast as possible. Probably you want to do that too. So let's get started. Um, I, in this presentation today, I will be talking about how to set up OpenSIPs as um, uh, in, a, in private networks so that you can um, put as many free switch or whatever media servers you want in uh, in a secure uh, and um, private uh, or um, uh, in the private network and have open SIPs uh, done uh, handle all the security and all the networking issues that might appear okay there we go so I will talk about uh, network constraints that might happen in different setups, um, about how to run OpenSIPs in clouds, because I've, I've seen that this is a big topic, uh, running different services and applications in the cloud these days. Uh, I will also uh, describe what OpenSIPs can do to improve and to minimize the settings or the effort you, um, you do to design and develop uh, uh, VoIP platforms using OpenSIPs, and then we'll draw some conclusions. So let's get started. For those, uh, is there anyone who hasn't heard of OpenSIPs until today? I'm glad. <laughs> so all of you know what OpenSIPs does. is a SIP proxy that, it, uh, that uh, is very, very flexible. It has more than 100 modules. I don't know exactly their number, but uh, we can easily find out. It's highly programmable. Uh, it has a configuration script that you can write and basically program SIP, right? Um, as, uh, my, uh, as Pete Kelly was saying earlier, you, you have access to requests, replies, and you basically use a scripting language to program how these uh, messages should behave, what to change for them, where to send them, and so forth and so on. It is highly scalable, it's written in C, um, and you can easily handle to uh, 20,000 calls per second or and have millions of simultaneous calls. And that's because uh, the main reason is that we don't handle media. This offers us a lot of flexibility and scalability. Uh, we don't have to be a part of, uh, we have to be uh, in, the f in the path of the entire uh, call from the SIP uh, signaling, but we don't have to have real-time uh, protocols. Uh, we don't have to handle that. Uh, common use cases for open SIPs is you, you may use it as an SBC, you can use it um, uh, in front of your free switch servers or media servers as a front end, as an entry point to, the, to your platform. You can have it used as trunking, as residential setups. You can also do call, call center queuing or you can have like residential or even virtual PBXs except for virtual PBXs, you won't be able to do media. Luckily, there are a lot of um, other projects, such as FreeSwitch, free of course, that can, uh, can handle that for us. So basically, you can easily build a virtual PBX with OpenSIPs. I'll probably have a talk about that uh, next year. Uh, we've done it. <laughs> um, regarding... Um, virtualization. Everybody asked me, uh, so actually there were a couple of people that were asking me how does OpenSIS behave uh, in a virtualized environment. 
The answer is perfect. That's because OpenSIFS doesn't need any privileged access to the operating system internals, so all we have to do is deploy it. So basically there are no constraints. You can run OpenSIFS in any virtualized or bare, uh, bare metal hardware. Uh, there's no significant overhead except for the virtualization itself, but that's something that, uh, that you have to live with. I mean, that's something known. Um, as long as you have the resources to uh, allocate for that specific uh, environment, uh, OpenSIPS uh, open can run without any problems. All it needs is uh, network access, right? Uh, the networking can be publicly or private. So I, I'm not going to talk about public networks because that's probably the most common scenario, and, uh, but I will talk about private uh, networks. So the question is why would you use or why would you set up OpenSIPS in a private network? Um, first of all, it offers an extra layer of security, right? If you don't have a public IP, then it might be a bit uh, harder for, um, for your, any attackers to reach your network and to reach your OpenSIPS service. You might run OpenSIPS uh, in an environment where you don't have, to s uh, you have limited access to public IPs. We all know that IPv6 is running out, or actually it ran out. Uh, so we, you really can't allocate, if you have, let's say, 10 OpenSIPS instances, you might not be able to offer each instance um, a public IP. Or you might run it in, a virtu in VPNs, in virtual private networks or of course in the cloud. So all these, um, all these solutions have different restrictions and we'll try to uh, categorize them and make them make a few um, uh, and see how we, we sort out these uh, restrictions. A, a, a basic concept that comes with OpenSIPS is the OpenSIPS listener. Basically a listener uh, is um, a binding uh, on an IP and port and the plus protocol. So in OpenSIPS you can have multiple listeners. For example, you can have a listener on TLS, a listener on SCTP, a listener for UDP, uh, uh, lis two listeners for two different ports. All you have to do uh, is define a listener like uh, listener equals uh, IP uh, column po uh, port and that's it. That, that's how you m configure OpenSIPS to listen. And based on that, uh, you can easily detect uh, or categorize the traffic based on the interface uh, the message came from. Uh, for example, you can use the capital RI, dollar capital RI uh, variable that tells you what's the interface, what's the listener that OpenSIPS uh, received the message on. And based on that, you can take several uh, decisions. Um, this is a common setup where you have, um, so you have OpenSIPS in the middle. It has one public uh, IP listener that talks to the internet uh, through the ISP network and one private listener. Here is your private network where you have your free switch storms and stuff like that. Um, so this is quite easy in order to bridge, to uh, have OpenSIPS bridge this, uh, these two networks, all you have to do is say something, if the received interface w was public IP, so if the message came this way, we simply force and socket this way. So when we send the message further, we will use this socket to send it to the free switch swar uh, swarm. Otherwise, if the message was, for example, an outbound call from free switch, we, uh, we get on this branch and we're forcing the public IP. So any messages that come this way will be sent further using the public IP. So as you can see, this is a small snippet that you can basically bridge any two transport, net, uh, transport protocols in, uh, in, open, in open CIFs, even if it's, I don't know, it might be here a web socket, TLS, SCTP. You can normalize everything here on UDP and only have free switch talk to UDP. This is kind of cool, right? However, things are not that easy. Why? Because nobody uses this setup in production, right? In production, we really need to have high availability. If not, we, are, uh, uh, we might run into problems when uh, one of OpenSIPS 
goes down when the network uh, there are network glitches or whatever. So we have to ensure that high availability, uh, our platform is highly available. And this is done using different setup. We can have active active, we can have active um, backup, like hot backups uh, systems. Uh, um, and actually, again, Pete was talking earlier, uh, these setups usually use a uh, virtual IP. Uh, this means uh, they ha uh, when you have, for example, two different OpenSIPS uh, setups, you only have one active. And if that goes down, you'll have to move a floating IP or a virtual IP. You have to move that IP to a second instance to make it work. This also requires a lot of monitoring because you have to uh, you have to detect when that uh, active node is down and have the tools to move the uh, the IPs on the other uh, on the other server uh, in terms of topology this is uh, what it looks like so we have again we have a public IP here a private network uh, here we have two open SIPs instances each of OpenSIPS instance listens on two different uh, virtual IPs. So this one listens to on the public uh, virtual IP and private virtual IP. However, these two interfaces are not uh, usable for the for the backup. Um, they are only available on the uh, active node. Uh, I'm not talking about any cast because in any cast scenarios both of them can be active. I'm only talking like uh, a, a classic high availability topology, uh, classic active backup setup. So in this case, uh, you'll, uh, when when OpenSIPS goes down, you uh, when the first OpenSIPS goes down, you'll have to move the virtual IP uh, uh, on the second node. This presumes that first you do monitoring, so you have to monitor and see that this OpenSIPS uh, is no longer uh, responsive. You can have tools like Monit, AJ Proxy, or whatever. You can have your own tool if uh, if you. Sorry. Uh, yep, I think you can do that. I'm I'm pretty sure you can do that too. You can have a, I don't know a, a RPC to query it and see if it's live. So you have the monitoring tools that's not part of OpenSIPS. You'll have to write them by yourself and because that, you know better how your platform beh behaves, right? You know better how, what the, what's the, services, what's the service that you offer. And you have to have tools that uh, can manage this, the, these virtual IPs and move them from one interface to the other. Uh, common tools are VRRPD or KeepAlive D or uh, Basically, uh, the VRRP protocol is the one that also can monitor the networking and do the the switching uh, automatically. So, what I've showed you is like a common setup where you don't have any network constraints. You can have uh, virtual VRRP running on your ISP network. You can have virtual. Uh, you can have VRRP running on your private network. However, it's not al always the same. So this is the fortunate scenarios where your ISP allows you to do whatever you want, where you have your own switches here and you allow uh, VRP traffic and so forth. What about network constraints? F who enforces them? Well, basically cloud providers are, uh, I've, I've noticed uh, throughout the years, they're the malefic uh, entity that doesn't allow you to do that simple setup. Why? Because they have their own self-managed network infrastructure. They, you don't. You really can't define networks within them because they will not route those uh, networks. Uh, you're, you will not be able to have a floating IP uh, in a cloud network because they don't allow VRRP. So you really can't uh, can't advertise uh, IPs as you want. But they do offer solutions uh, to to do this uh, high availability. For example, uh, AWS has the Elastic IP. Not sure you know what Elastic IP is. Yeah, okay. It's it's an IP that um, it's a public IP that can be mapped to one or a different private IP, but they have to be different IPs. So you you really can't use a virtual IP over there. 
Moreover, I've seen a couple of data centers that don't allow you to do whatever you want with your network. For example, uh, most of the data centers, if you don't buy your own uh, switch or, or your own router, uh, they have mul uh, multicast disabled. This means that VRP is not uh, available, or they really don't, uh, or they really deny VRP traffic. So we have to get uh, a different, another solutions. Uh, first of all, let's analyze how OpenSIPs or how this looks like, uh, how networking looks like uh, in a cloud uh, from OpenSIPs open perspective. So we have here uh, the internet and the ISP net uh, cloud ISP network, which is basically this is what they manage. You really can't do anything uh, on this side. Here, you can do stuff, but only what's, uh, so here is the cloud uh, managed network. This is, for example, this is AWS network, where you can do some stuff, you have an API for that, uh, but you really, you can do like, uh, you can run anything you want, right? It's, it's just, it's a very uh, strictly controlled network here that can only be controlled using some APIs. And here, let's say that you have uh, your own network that you can hire, or virtual network that you can uh, you can have a VPN or whatever you want that you can uh, have anything down there. So you, in this scenario, uh, let's consider we can have here a private virtual IP. This is uh, a simple setup. We'll see later what happens if we don't have this, but I'll I'll, I'll present later. So in this setup, we have open, uh, two different OpenSIPs instances. W each of them on the public side listen on different private IPs, because this is, uh, you probably noticed, or if you've ever used uh, AWS, you start an instance, you won't get a public IP right, right then. You'll only have a private IP, and you'll get uh, an elastic IP here that you'll be able to map and move around through uh, around your instances. And let's say, uh, of course, that elastic IP can only be mapped to one single IP, so let's say we map it here. What happens if first instance goes down? Well, you, uh, we will have the same mechanisms as earlier to move the private virtual IP uh, of OpenSIPs here, and we'll have the, um, the APIs that the AWS provides to move the public IP from this uh, IP to this one. So basically, we change the public-private mapping to to the new uh, server. To be able to do that, uh, it's very important that this instance is aware of all the uh, ongoing dialogues, all the dialogues that were started on this uh, on this uh, instance, because otherwise we won't be able to route them properly. And this is the, this was done using, uh, or this is done in OpenSIP. This is done using the binary protocol and the cluster module. I'm not talking about this today because I've had a couple of presentations last year and two years ago about this. Um, you can check them uh, online if you are interested in this. The point is, uh, replication is di is done really fast using a binary protocol, uh, so we we don't have to lose time parsing stuff. We we send them already parsed and OpenSIPs uh, loads them in memory and basically behaves as the dialogue was started on that specific node. The information that we replicate is dialogue information, um, like call ID from tag to tag, this is used to identify the, the dialogue. The route set, this is used to know how, uh, what are the hops of our call in order to route the request properly. If, the, if something goes wrong uh, and we, we miss this, we don't have this information, then really, really don't know how to close the call. And other internal information such as CSEX or SDPs or um, I don't know, uh, accounting variables, accounting information, accounting context, profiles and stuff like that, all of them are carried in this binary, uh, binary protocol. Uh, so how this will work when we get an invite, the caller uh, sends an invite to the public IP, AWS knows the mapping public IP to the private IP, he will forward the invite here, OpenSIS will receive it, 
uh, and he will send an invite uh, down to free switch, let's say, or to your uh, media server. He will also say, well, uh, I have this dialog now, uh, and its route set is the following. So we received it from contact. So the contact is this guy's contact. We received it on private IP one, is this interface, and we will send it further from private uh, VIP down to this, uh, to this uh, endpoint. However, when this instance receives this information, there's a problem. Do you see one? This guy has no idea who private IP one is. He only knows about private IP two. Uh, private IP two is the only listener. Now, there are two different, uh, this can be handled, uh, handled in two different ways. Why? Uh, one, ignore. If we don't, if we don't have uh, virtual, uh, if we don't know virtual IP one, we can simply choose uh, another interface. The question is, what interface we, sh we should use? So that's problematic because if we choose the private one, when we'll have to send messages here, we'll basically to send them like this. That will not work, right? So in order to fix this, we uh, developed in 3.0 uh, the, um, the tagging mechanism, the listener tagging mechanism. This was introduced, uh, as I said, in 3.0, and this is used to create some mappings between OpenSIP's uh, internal, uh, internal listeners and some names. So basically, they are quite simple. All they are, uh, there are some mappings that are used to match different uh, listeners uh, in different OpenSIP uh, instances. Um, the idea is quite simple, but it's quite flexible because you don't have to do any provisioning on any, on, on any of the nodes. All you have to do is specify. So this is, uh, this is the common, this is the way you specify a listener, UDP colon private IP. All you have to say is tag, uh, public tag, on one instance, and all the instances have to have the same thing. So for example, in, on the second instance, you have private IP2 with the same tag. This, let's go back to our, um, to our setup. In, uh, here we'll have the private IP1 with tag pub, and private IP2 with tag pub. So each OpenSIP has a listener and uh, the same tag. This means that when OpenSIP uh, replicates uh, replicates the information, this instance will see will no longer see private IP1 because he doesn't know who private IP1 is, but he will see tag pub. And he will know that tag pub is basically private IP2. So the mapping is done automatically and we don't have any surprises when we, ra uh, when we route traffic back. In this scenario, when OpenSIP this node goes down, uh, the virtual IP again will be moved here. The AWS management will have to instruct. Uh, we will have to uh, instruct the AWS uh, networking ma management that the IP has moved on private IP two. So this way, when the buy the buy comes here, we will know to use this interface to send it further uh, down to the client. So this will simply work. So the tag mechanism is qu a quite simple mechanism, but uh, allows us in OpenSys 3.0, allows us to do uh, uh, scenarios like this, for example, in, w in AWS, where you don't have, w where you are not allowed to have a private uh, VIP on this side. All you have to do is to use their specific unicast uh, messages, uh, IPs, sorry. That's not enough. Uh, what if we don't have uh, uh, the flexibility to have our own network on the private side? So why, what if we have this setup where here we have the public IP of the cloud, which maps to different, uh, so this is the elastic IP, which maps to different private IPs, and that's all we have, because that's all AWS allows us to have. We're, we, we didn't buy an extra networking uh, layer, or we don't want to set up a VPN on the uh, private side. We just have a bunch of free switch servers in the same, uh, in the same cloud, in the same uh, region. And uh, we will use a single IP to uh, talk to them. 
Well, the idea is the same. So we'll have uh, we'll have to tag each interface. So OpenSys now only listens on one interface, and we have the same tag on each uh, uh, on on each instance. However, the pro um, when we start the call, we'll have this call flow, right? That this, this is normal. But what happens? Uh, okay, we will replicate information, the, the dialogue information, to the second node. This will work fine because we have the tagging mechanism and everything works out. The problem is when OpenSIPS goes down. What happens? So, okay, OpenSIPS goes down. We will instruct the AWS management to move the mapping from the public IP to the private IP to move it uh, on this IP, right? But what happens from free switch or the media server perspective? He doesn't know, he doesn't have the elastic IP, he will only have the private IP, correct? So when, if free switch wants to send a buy, he, all he knows is this private IP one. So he will start sending buys, but there's no OpenSIPS instance there, nobody will answer, and he will start to do retransmissions and stuff like that, and the call will not end. That's because FreeSwitch is not aware of the tag. The tag is something that we've developed for OpenSIPS, and it's only used, uh, it's basically only a name used in OpenSIPS uh, used to match different listeners. Uh, so the main problem is that FreeSwitch or other SIP entities inside our network are not allowed, uh, are not uh, aware of this tagging, and are, they are not aware of um, IP moving or mapping moving uh, AWS does. So we need a way or a mean to uh, tell those um, those ent SIP entities that the contact is no longer where they knew it, but it has changed on a different uh, node. Luckily, this uh, this has already been sorted out ever uh, ever since the beginning in RFC 3261 and uh, later in 3311. All we have to do is send an invite or an update down to the uh, to the um, SIP entity saying, "Well, we were over there, but we changed our contact, and now, now we are on uh, private IP too." There's a catch here because. Uh, you can change, uh, so according to SIP, you can change the uh, contact of one endpoint, but you cannot change the route set. Uh, this means that um, if we change the route set, uh, if we are not allowed to change the route set, you will have open SIPs uh, to behave as, uh, as an endpoint. And this is done using the topology hiding module, right? So, uh, Let's see how this works. Basically, we have we had this call like so. OpenSIPS goes down. Uh, in this case, we detect that and we trigger a reinvite from this instance, saying, "Well, I'm no longer to in private IP one, but uh, rather on private IP two. We, we trigger this reinvite, and uh, this free switch will know that the uh, the contact is private IP two. And from that, uh, from this point, he will know where to send the buy, right? This is another uh, MI or um, uh, MI command that we've developed in 3.0, and it's used for a lot of other scenarios, such as uh, so. As you can see, you can update dialog endpoints. You can manually trigger pings inside the dialog to keep the dialog al uh, alive. So you don't have to do that. Um, uh, based on a timer. You can use it to change uh, or to force an RTP proxy inside an ongoing call. You can also use it to convert inbound, uh, inbound DTMF digits to out-of-band out DTMF message. So it's quite a, a very simple but powerful uh, command. Um, this is, uh, I don't think I have any more time, do I? Okay, this is a short slide that shows how um, how to do a failover using RTP proxy or, or RTP engine. Uh, it's quite simple. All you have to do is trigger a reinvite and engage a different proxy set, and then you will use uh, R the RTP will go th uh, through the new RTP proxy. So that's it. Uh, I don't. Uh, do I have time for conclusions or for? Yep. 
Thank you. Uh, so basically, uh, what's important to understand is that uh, you have to understand your network constraints and network requirements when you set up OpenSIPs and w check whether you need or uh, whether you need those uh, mechanisms that I presented earlier. Um, there are not that many, uh, uh, not that many features that uh, enha enhance this uh, this behavior. As you've so as you've seen, it's only listener tags and a way to update the dialogue endpoints, and that's it. You can ensure media availability and do all sorts of nasty stuff. All right, big round of applause for Razvan. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>